You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Have us to learn from them what you would have us to, to live, and um, we don't we don't want to misinterpret or go beyond what is written. So, Lord, let's pray for your uh, just continued guidance and clarity as we go through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, First Thessalonians chapter five, verses twelve and thirteen. That's what we were looking at last time when we were so rudely interrupted by running out of time. So just a quick reminder of what what was going on there, that the church in Thessalonica is a young church. Remember, Paul had been there and had some success, Paul and Silas. There had been some converts, and they had quickly been driven out of the city. So these elders are not yet recognized as elders. These are, are, are men that are leaders in the church, but they're not called elders in this passage. Uh, so it doesn't appear that they were recognized as elders yet and very unlikely that they were paid elders. Right? So these are, the, these are the people that Paul is talking about in this passage. And we saw last time that we're to know or to acknowledge or to respect those who do certain things in the church, those who diligently labor among you, those who have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction or admonish you. Okay? So we're to acknowledge people that do those things. And I was admonished last week, wonderfully so, by Brian. Was it last week, though, that he was talking about the guy that took his socks off and wouldn't put them back on? No, was that the week before last? Okay, that kind of bothered me. <laughs> it wasn't an admonition. But if you take your socks off, you don't put them back on, do you? Nobody does that, so I don't know where that, what that was all about. I'm looking forward to... <laughs> A further admonition today. Unless he talks about socks again, then that's a problem. Uh, verse 13 is where we want to be today. Again, we request you, brethren, you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And then verse 13, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. So we're to esteem them very highly. There's a... Uh, that the word there that's translated very highly is an interesting word. It's used in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And this will give you an idea of what Paul means by very highly in this in this verse. Uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. That abundantly beyond, that more abundantly beyond, that's the same word. Now, when we think of Ephesians 3, 20, 21 and what the Lord can do abundantly beyond all that we can ask or even think, we have a very high view of that, right? That means anything. He's able to do anything far beyond what we can ask or even think. Well, it's that same highness, that same magnitude that's talked about in Verse 13 here. We are to esteem these men in that way. Super abundantly. Very highly. Right? So I want to think about that for a little bit. How does that work out? Now this is talking about esteeming. It's not talking about paying or complimenting or... It's talking about esteeming. Having in your mind an idea about these men that is very high. We're to esteem them super abundantly. Right? And when I first wrote this, as you can see it's been a while since I wrote this lesson, but Michael Phelps was all over the news, right? How many gold medals did Michael Phelps win? Eight in this Olympics, right? And how many world records did he set? Seven. seven. Yeah, seven. Good guess, Carol. <laughs> Seven world records, eight gold medals. Greatest Olympic whatever in history, right? 
So we esteem him highly for that, don't we? We talk a lot about Michael Phelps, and he's all over the news, and he's getting paid lots of money, and he has lots of gold medals, and what a great thing that he did. When you get right down to it, what is, what what makes Michael Phelps? Why are we talking about Michael Phelps? He can swim fast. Pretty much it, right? <laughs> if you saw interviews with Michael Phelps. Nice young man, fine, great. But he can swim fast, right? And so we esteem him highly because he can swim fast. What does verse 13 say? Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Esteem them because of their work. His work is he can swim fast, and he worked very hard, and he devoted you know hours and hours and hours, and that's all wonderful. I'm not criticizing Michael Phelps. He's a great swimmer. A great athlete. But somebody shared the gospel with you. Somebody extended to you the very words of life. That's a greater work, right? You had a Sunday school teacher when you were a kid that told you about Noah. The whole story of Noah and glorified God through telling you about Noah. That's a greater work, isn't it? It's greater than running, being able to run a hundred meters in whatever it was, nine point something, something. Right? We talk a lot about guys who can do those things. And it's wonderful. We have a a girl that is maybe, I don't know, 17 years old that can balance on a stick. And that's great. It's hard to balance on a stick. If you ever tried to balance on a stick, it's hard to do. It's a wonderful accomplishment. But somebody else gets up here and causes me to praise and glorify God and become more Christ-like through sharing of the Word. And there's just no comparison. So if we're going to esteem someone, and we, the nice thing is we don't have a bucket of respect, that we only have so much that we can dole out, right? So you can, you can love the athletes and, and admire them, but relatively speaking, the admiration, the esteem that should come from someone that's opening the Word to you is much greater. So somebody that diligently labors among you, has charge over you in the Lord, gives you instruction, they're to be esteemed super abundantly. Does that make sense? I just have a question. Who who are they if they're not elders? These are men who are probably functioning as elders, just hadn't been recognized as elders, probably would be later, but they're just not called that here. The church is too young probably just to have a formal recognition of, of elders. Yeah, there probably just had not been time to observe these men and to come to the conclusion that, yes, they've been called as elders or functioning as elders. That's probably all it was. Yep. There are people in our congregation who are not called elder or deacon who do all three of those things. They work hard, they have positions of authority and responsibility, and they do the kind of function of the monarchy. Yep. And it's those people that we're to esteem highly. We're not just talking about elders. Right? Who is that? In our church, I don't know. Is there someone who does that for you? There, there are. There are. I can give you examples. I would do that because I don't want to embarrass Lanny. But, <laughs> but, he, but he does that sort of thing for me, Dale. There are men that I esteem very highly because they, they are mentors to me. They're men that I, that I look to as examples of Christ. I imitate them in order to imitate Christ. So there can be those sorts of men. We are talking about elders, and elders uh, elders must serve these functions. But there are others that, that do. Right? Anything else? Matt? No? i got to make one point about this. And Jim, we were talking about this at, at lunch, and Jim says, does it make you uncomfortable talking about this as an elder, about how we're supposed to esteem people who do the functions of elders? And it doesn't for me because I, you know, I'm the, I really am the least of the elders and I'm planning to kind of fade into the background eventually and go back over with the youth. So it doesn't give me a problem. What I'm telling you really to do is esteem some other people. <laughs> okay? That's, that's my intent. But none of us are worthy of that esteem. 
none of us would, would say that we're worthy of that esteem, and none of us really are, in a sense, worthy of that esteem. Only insofar as we do these three things, the scripture says we're to be esteemed very highly, but we're not in some sense, you know, great people who should be esteemed because of our greatness. It's because of the work. That's what it's all about, the work. Is the work something valuable? If it is, then those people who do it ought to be esteemed highly. Sir? There's a difference in putting someone on a telescope and set them in esteem. Or just one gym. Kind of like idolize them for doing the right work. You have to see the diligence he puts in. You can tell it by the preaching. Same with you, Jeff, more often, people like that. But I would never put a human being on a pedestal. God is the only one we put on a pedestal. Right. So there's nothing wrong with saying hey, that was a great service and God used you to touch my heart this morning. You know, yeah. and sometimes we put in the word "a great message," and I know this makes some pastors, maybe like Jim or like uh, other pastors I know, you know, feel a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I think it does. I think it does make it makes probably anybody uncomfortable. Yeah, because it you, you know you really do. Have, that's a great point. I mean, you really do have to be careful. These men are opening up the word of God to you. If there was some edification there, it wasn't in the man opening it up. It was in the word, right? And that's really true. It's not just something to say. It's really true. I mean, I could come in here and do a fantastic, let's teach economics. I could come in here and do a fantastic economics lesson. I would do it. Me. Fantastic economics lesson. There's no power in that. It's completely useless. I can... We can just share, all I do, what anybody does, share from the word, what does it say, and then you're edified by that. That's really all. It's hard work, but. I'm trying to think what Brian said the other one, that one sermon on that issue. You know, that, uh, the person who comes to him afterwards, and, uh, I don't know what he said, he said uh, somebody comes to you and they say it was a wonderful sermon, and then the person says, whoa, it's all of God. Right. I mean, it was the person that gave the message of God's word. There, the person can. The person that should. That, yep. Know. Yep. You want to clarify? I, I can add to that by saying that, that you can tell that a person is diligent in the Lord Amen. by the amount of time that they spend and effort they put into something that they are called to do. Right. And we appreciate that. Right. And there, there should be no false humility in hey. Yeah, I, this is hard work. It, it's hard work. And I'm trying to handle the Word of God honestly and truthfully. It's hard work. But if there's any, if there's any good that comes of it, you have to recognize that it doesn't come from a man. You know, it just doesn't. Uh, okay. So just, just to be clear on that, we're to esteem these people highly who do these things. Not because they're perfect people or they're somehow whatever, but because of the work. Okay, now we're going to completely switch gears and go to another place. But first I'm going to ask you a question. See if you know this. As I thought this, this is totally trivia, kind of. There's four books of the New Testament that Paul wrote directly to individuals, to an individual. Four of them. Can you name all four of them? First and second Timothy, right? Titus. Titus. Philemon. See, Philemon was, is the one that that's kind of, you know, you may not remember. We're going to look at two of those books over the next however much time. Uh, First Timothy and Titus. And I want to kind of set those up real briefly. Uh, you know, Timothy and Titus were assistants to Paul. They traveled with him on his missionary journeys throughout his ministry. Uh, the books of First Timothy and Titus were written after the events of Acts. The church at Ephesus, Timothy is charged with kind of going back and fixing the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus had its problems, and we'll see what those are. So Paul wrote First Timothy to Timothy saying, this is what needs to happen at this church. So there is of necessity in that a lot about leadership. Because the leadership was not qualified. There were some things that were going on there in Ephesus. 
Uh, Titus was charged with setting up churches in Crete, so there's a lot of the same same sort of stuff. Here's what a leader of a church ought to look like. Here's what an elder ought to look like, if you can all look like. So that's uh, that's why these books are fairly heavy with stuff on eldership. If you turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 3 is where we'll spend almost all of our time. We're going to look through the great passage on qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3. We're going to start with verses 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. And it says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. This is Paul writing to Timothy. But in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So, Paul's telling Timothy, what I'm writing you here is how a person ought to conduct themselves in the household of God. This is how church ought to function. And it's important that church functions, right, because it's the pillar and support of the very truth of the gospel itself. It's important. And Timothy's giving him, or Timothy's getting very valuable and absolutely vital instruction. And we'll see, uh, I'll emphasize that again in a little bit. Um, Acts chapter 20, don't turn there because we spent a lot of time studying Acts chapter 20. Remember that was Paul's talking to the elders, the Ephesian elders, remember that? He told them to shepherd the church of God. Told them about the savage wolves that would come in among them. Right, remember all that? Well, Paul was right. Savage wolves did come in among them. We went from that address to the Ephesian elders to, uh, turn back a couple chapters here. First Timothy 1. We'll read the first seven verses. Verse 7, verses of 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. you got to love the way Paul writes. Huh? The sarcasm even there. I mean, he's saying they want to be teachers of the law. They don't know first thing that they're t- what they're talking about. These are the people that Timothy has to go and deal with. They're apparently they wanted to be teachers of the law. They wanted to teach the, the church at Ephesus, and they so they're, they're wanting to assume this leadership role, this teaching role, and they're not qualified. So Timothy needs to deal with that. Uh, turn back a few verses, chapter one, verses eighteen through twenty. Paul's already dealt with some of them. It says, this command I entrust to you, this is verses 18 through 20 of chapter 1. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Okay, so Paul's already dealt with two of the ringleaders there, we're kicking them out of the church. But there's still a problem there, and Timothy's going now to address it. So that's the setting. We went from this beautiful moment where Paul's with these elders, and it's it's a wonderful time. He's giving them all this wonderful biblical instruction to this kind of mess because of the problems in leadership at Ephesus. So we're going to look at the uh, passage of qualifications, and you see how important now the qualifications were at Ephesus. And they remain just as important today. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. And this is where we'll spend the next uh, probably few weeks. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? 
and not a new convert, so that he'll not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach or the snare of the devil. Those are the qualifications of, of elders in First Timothy. Similar list in Titus that we'll, we'll look at eventually. So I want to just kind of go through this verse by verse. The, the first verse, First Timothy 3.1, this is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's fine work he desires to do. If you, if you look at that for a second, it might kind of strike you for a second. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. Or in your NIV, it may say, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. King James says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. There's two words there. Both translated desire in King James. It's aspire and desire in New American Standard. It sets his heart on and desire in the, in the NIV. There's two different words there. But a man desires the office of overseer. He, he desires the work. Does that bother you at all? That there's a desire for that office? Linda? Yeah, it kind of depends on what they're desiring and why they're desiring it, doesn't it? It, it? it kind of bothered me when I first started looking. Tim, Thomas? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what, say, what kind of makes it clear, isn't it? Oh, he desires work? Oh, well, that's okay. Right? That's, that's right. That's, those must be the right motives, that he desires a work. It's not so much the office as the work. But would it, what would you think of someone who did desire the office? They wanted to be a pastor. They wanted to be an elder. What would you, what would you think about that? Yeah. He said anyone who goes to college to be a pastor is aspiring to that position, must be aspiring to that position. That's true. Does it bother you if someone wants to be a pastor? I was just thinking in line with what my wife said. If he feels called to be a pastor, he wants to do it. But we don't know that at the time. Right. Right. You don't know that at the time. If he's called to be a pastor, then that's what he has to do. Uh, We'll go through this. I think it'll it'll make more sense. But but the idea is that the man really does desire the work. And it's the work that he desires, uh, hopefully. Now, there may be men, if in fact they don't desire the work, but they desire the office, they want to be up in front. Um, I don't understand them, uh, for one thing. If, if what they want is to be esteemed, if what they want is to be, you know, the man in charge, then obviously those motives um, would be called into question. If they want to do the work of an overseer, then... Um, you know, that's a that's the right motivation. But I want you to see the two different words. Carol? Do you know what you think? Is the piano playing on its own? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I told you there was trouble in the sound booth, didn't I? Oh, it's Deidre's fault. It's been a long time since Deidre distracted my Sunday school class. <laughs> it's nice, you know. Some some people when they when they when they preach, they have background music. It just didn't seem appropriate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Crystal Cathedral. There's there's two words here for. Uh, were you going to say something, Carol? Before we're so rudely interrupted. <laughs> no, I think you're supposed to. Ooh, good. that's a good comment. I like that. Yeah. Did you all hear that? Yeah, okay. We should put that on the bulletin next week. So I'm not going to save him. <laughs> uh, all right. So there's, 
again, there's two words for desire. I think it's interesting if we look at those. The, the uh, again, the translation's a little different from version to version. I'm going to put up the. Uh, well, I'm not going to put up any of the, the, the translations. I'm going to show you the first word that's translated aspire in the New American Standard or set his heart on in your NIV. Uh, that's used only a couple other places in Scripture. And I think if we see all three places, this is one, and then these other two, you'll, you'll get a sense of what the word means. A little better than just saying aspire. I underline them. Hebrews 11, you know, Hebrews 11, the faithful people. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. I'll read it here. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it, make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they'd been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. First Timothy 6, 1 through 10. 1 through 10? I don't think that's 1 through 10. So I think I wrote that wrong. Let me correct that. I don't like to have the wrong thing yet. Nine and ten. Oh, it's actually just verse ten. That's just verse ten. First Timothy six ten. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Okay. So do you get more of a sense of the word literally means stretching out, reaching out. Trying to grasp, right? trying to trying to achieve something, trying to get something. So it's a practical desire. It's a it's more, aspiration is a little better because you're actually trying to achieve it. So you're actively taking steps to achieve this thing. Um, in Hebrews 11, they were actively living out their faith in desiring desiring heaven. In First Timothy 6, they're Striving for money. They're trying to get money. And it's that that's causing many griefs. Here, the man aspires to the office. He does those things that would be required for him to, to achieve that role in the church. Right? So it's, it's practical. Right? So let's think about that for a second. If somebody, if we had a young man here listening, and they wanted to... They aspire to the work of an elder, to an overseer. What sorts of things ought they be doing now? Right? Wouldn't you think? Races leading Bible studies. They should be, if there's a teaching opportunity offered to them, they should take it. Um, If there's an Awana club that is looking for people to teach a class or to teach the TNT kids, and if someone comes to them and asks if they'd like to do it, they would welcome that opportunity. Right? If we need somebody to teach adult Sunday school or to teach a youth Sunday school, right? these, are the, these are the steps that, that someone would take. What else besides, besides that? What's that? What do you mean? Okay, so understanding who they are and that their their work is of Christ or it's of or it's nothing. If it, coming to some scriptural understanding about the work. And what else? Right, it, that has to be a matter of prayer, right? They have to be. They have to have a a pretty good regular prayer life, regular. Bible study. They have to be in the Word. All of these things. They, they should be developing, working towards this. Right? They also, and we're going to have a whole list of qualifications here. They understand what those are and making sure that they meet them. They're things you can do long before you're ever considered as an elder that could disqualify you forever from being an elder. So if you desire that work, 
You've got to protect yourself. You've got to, you've got to be guarding your eye. Okay? So that's the aspires part of it. There's also a desires part of it. And this word is used all the time in Scripture. Just going to put up a few examples. It's translated lots of different ways. It's a, it's a, it's a great word. It really gives you the idea here. A um, whole bunch of different passages. All the underlines are the same word, epithemeo. Matthew 5.28 says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That word lust is the same word that's translated desire here in 1 Timothy 3.1. Wow. Right. One clearly good, one clearly bad. It's a, it's a passionate desire for something. The object of the desire that makes it sin or, or makes it noble. Okay. Not, not the desire itself. Luke 15.16 you know this story. This I use the NIV because the New American Standard doesn't really translate the word. Kind of is a little odd. But it says, He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So you can imagine that. You're, you're starving. You're hungry. You're so hungry, you long to eat pig food. Okay? Not pig, but pig food. Not bacon. True. <laughs> pig food. You're so hungry, you long for that. It's a passionate desire. It's a hunger. Luke 22.15 says, And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This is Christ at the Last Supper. I've earnestly desired to eat this with you. I, I've, I've looked forward to this. Longed for this. Romans 7.7 7, What shall we say that is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. The same word is translated as covet. Okay? You know, coveting, you have this... this Deep emotional desire to have what that other person has. Right? You want that. James 4.2 says you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. It's that lust that James is talking about. is the same word. Revelation 9.6 says, And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. So in the midst of the horrors of, of that time, they long for death. They hope for death. So does that give you an idea of the strength of the word? This man aspires, if a man aspires to the office of overseer, that is, he's taking the steps that are required. Right? He's guarding his life. He's taking opportunities. He's learning from the word. He's doing those things. He also desires the work. He has a passion for the work. And that's what we look for in someone that wants to be an overseer, an elder. Yeah, that's the first question. Is that the first? We think of this as a list of qualifications, and that first verse is just sort of the header, right? That's just sort of. Okay, what are the qualifications? Have we listed the first qualification? He has to have that passionate desire and have made practical steps toward toward that. All right? That seems to be the first qualification, doesn't it? And you could have one of these and not the other. There are people who have the first type of desire, that first aspiration. They're taking the practical steps towards being a pastor and they... They go to Bible college or they go to seminary because, you know, it's a good option. My dad was a pastor. And his dad was a pastor. It, you know, the hours are good and people are nice to you. Pay's not great, but, don't, you know, I, I learned to be frugal as a kid. That person, is are they qualified to be a pastor? They don't have the passionate desire that it talks about here in First Timothy 3.1. You can go the other way too. You have people who have the passionate desire. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Boy, that is really what I want to do. But I don't really like to study. But I really want to teach. I really want to teach. But, you know, reading books, that's kind of... I'm not really into that. Well, then you've got... You're not willing to have the discipline to take the steps. And it's not going to work either, right? Got to have both. So I think that is maybe the first qualification. 
What is it that the man desires? Again, desires work. He desires a task. And the, the Bible says that, uh, well, first of all, what is, let's define that task again, just so we know what we're talking about. And so this is somebody who has to, they love the word. They really love the word. They really love to sit down and go through it. And, and even when they're tired, they're digging stuff out of it. And it's just, they can't, that's the thing that they have to do. There's almost a constraint. They have to do this. Uh, even if it's something, you know, they have to move away or they have to do something else. They're not recognized as an elder in that church. They're still going to be studying. They're still going to be pulling out their commentary. I wonder what that really means. In the, and they're getting books. That's just who they are. That's who they are. That's the work that they must do. They have to have opportunities to, to teach, to share from the Word, to learn from the Word. Uh, I've heard MacArthur talk about this. He, he actually says the, the least engaging part of his ministry is the preaching. The most engaging part is the study. If he could study, 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 and write, and write, and write, that's what he would do. But he knows that he, he, he is under a constraint to share that with his people in preaching. Right? But it's the studying to him that's even, even more engaging and more exciting. So how does it work? First of all, we know the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, right? That we learned from, from uh, Acts 20. The Holy Spirit has made these men overseers. The Holy Spirit gives them the passion, gives them the desire for the work. Once they have the desire for the work, they begin to take those steps. And they make known their desire, and they take the steps that would be required. And then, after a time of proving themselves, they may be recognized by the eldership of the church, or they may not be. And if they are so recognized, then that is brought to the church, and also people outside the church. If they find a reproach against that man, that man is disqualified. If not, then to be recognized as an elder and continue on with the work. Right? And that's, that's what Timothy is being tasked to kind of get going here in Ephesus. One last question about that, and my timing is not very good today. What if a man has that desire, goes through all this, is clearly qualified to be an elder, serves as an elder, serves faithfully, but then he loses the desire. He doesn't want to do it anymore. It's just kind of... I don't... <laughs> I don't think I've ever known an elder well, a pastor well, that hasn't at some point decided they weren't going to do it anymore. <laughs> because it's really discouraging sometimes. Right? And the, I'll just give you... No, I won't give you any examples because... It's discouraging to even give examples. But they're just things that happen, and they're just really discouraging. Especially the more the more that people work, the more that they do, the more discouraged they can become, because you know they're dealing with people. So, what if they just decide, I just don't want to do this anymore? What should they do? Hmm? Yeah, they should, they should pray and get right with God. Right? <laughs> Right? Make sure that their will is aligned with God's and in that matter, sure. Yeah. Well, I think that that's the time also in the fellowship ministry um, to allow them to encourage them and to you know, especially pastors, you know, when you go to a time the pastor who just left out there and just you give and give and give and the fellowship you don't get back. You know, mm-hmm. and and it just happens anyway. It goes to anyway. All right. That's why our, we're taught to esteem them very highly, right? To order, in order to prevent that discouragement. God is not unaware that there's discouragement with leadership, so He asks us to to esteem them very highly, and in Hebrews, to, to basically make their life as easy as possible. Yes. This is hypothetical, right? <laughs> First of all, let's get that straight. Uh, 
The other elders would beat him into submission, I think, would be the, the, the answer to that. Yeah, what about that? I mean, I actually struggle. I don't know, I don't know the answers here. Do you, can you retire from eldership? Look, the, the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. But I think you, all, you have to have the desire for the work. So, could it be that at some point the Holy Spirit says, well, you've done your time? You know, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I know a lot of retired pastors. You may get to the point where you say, physically I'm just unable to do this, or mentally I'm not able to do this anymore. And in a sense I'm, I'm disqualified. I, sense, I just can't do it. And, you know, that's reasonable. That's, you know, you die, you can't do it. So there, <laughs> there may be a time at which you can't do it. Thomas? Did you say early on that it was more of a You begin to, you know, maybe wonder if you really were called, or maybe you wonder if, if I'm really, am I doing a decent job? I don't know. Maybe that's. This is, you see where I have a struggle with this because anytime you teach a lesson, anybody who teaches in here, you can you can tell me if I'm wrong. You always feel like you did a pretty bad job. That's just the when you're teaching the word. Right? When you're teaching something else, it's not true. When you're teaching from the Word, you always at the end feel like, well, that was minimally adequate. Good job for me. Right? That's as good as I'm going to be able to do this. There are occasions when there's a, there's a teaching gift at work, when you actually are kind of, and it's hard to describe if you've never experienced it, when you actually step, and I don't want to make this out to be some sort of mystical experience, it isn't that at all. You're still speaking and thinking, but you're doing it at a level that is above what you've think you could ever possibly do. And you walk away from that and go, I don't know what that was all about. I hope to have that again next week. <laughs> right? And so and then maybe you don't. We have a we have terms that we share about how we think we did that I won't share with you because they they're just not uh, appropriate for discovery. But you just really uh, and I I've, I've seen Jim up here and he's taught this lesson and you know, I see him afterwards and he's like, well, that was, you know, <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> like, I didn't say what I thought I was going to say. And, I, and I'm like, that was amazing. It was, it was great. It was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the way we have to look at it. Right? What What's most encouraging to me is, and I'll use I'll use Connor. Um, he's one of the kids on YouTube. He's an amazing kid. Uh, we'll be talking about something, you know, teaching some passage, and he'll say, "Didn't you say dot dot dot?" Con- yeah. I said Connor, that was four years ago. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Right, isn't that's it right there? That's it. I'm done. Okay, I'm good for another six months right there, right? <laughs> right. So I don't, I, I don't know. It it's really is something to think about. Is is 
what does ha- if a man loses the desire for the work, why is that? And what is there? And you know, where do we go from there? And I guess it's a case by case thing. I think a man can become discouraged to the point of saying, you know, I'm just done. And I'm just. I think if, if a person, if, if there's a motive for that. If a person, we're serving, if we stop looking at numbers and so on, and converting things around that, and I think people are coming in all that. Right. Uh, Noah, you know, speaks for 100,000 years, and I want to convert the whole vision and all that. But if we realize that we're called, and I think uh, God will always. Yeah. At the end of his life, God tells him, show your son all his sons. I mean, until we die, we're going to have that big test each and every time. So uh, I think it's a matter of us realizing that we are serving the Lord and nothing more, nothing less. And mm-hmm. I guess that we can bring whatever accomplishments that God may or may not do to us. I don't know that I can answer that from Scripture. It seems to be... There, there's, I can say that there's no provision in Scripture for a, a person to retire. There, or to, to stop. To stop doing the work. There is provision for disqualification. There's provision for restoration. Which seems to almost argue against the idea that you can just quit. You know? I don't know. Can't think of it. Oh, we retired at 50? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't dealing with the element there. Is oh. <clears throat> <laughs> Doug, hi. Is there that dynamic there in our culture that if you even hint the fact that you're going to step down, it's over for you, or else you're sending a signal of some way. No? And maybe I'm wrong on this, okay? But I, I, I hear this idea, and maybe this isn't exactly what you're saying, but I'm burnt out. Alright? I'm burnt out, I need a break. And you know, I appreciate people are human beings and they get tired. They get physically tired and emotionally tired and mentally tired. But what does the scripture say? Persevere. Do not grow weary in well doing. It says don't, don't get tired in doing well. Don't. So you, you, you get up, you put your hands to the plow and you keep pushing. That seems to be and again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing something. But that's that's what it looks like. If I would allow myself the idea of growing weary and well-doing, I would absolutely grow weary and well-doing. But maybe I'm missing something. Carol, am I missing something? I'm missing the meaning as well. Okay. Because uh, I just can't imagine Paul. Oh, 
Yeah, even in prison. <laughs> hey, why don't you take a break, buddy? You're in prison. Thomas? Jim, did you have You might be able to change your, I mean, it's a, it's a fact as long as you draw a breath, you, you have to be about the, the glory of your, your king. That's, I think we all would agree to that. As long as I have a breath, that breath is given to me that I might glorify the Lord through service in some way. But, the, but I guess the question that I can't answer, that I don't know the answer to, is if you are serving as an elder, is there a, a time in which, you know, Biblically, you can say, I no longer desire the work and step away from it. I don't know. And I'm late, so I'm going to pray and leave that open. Father, we are again just thankful for your word. There is, uh, there is much in it and it's exciting to us and um, it's, 
just learning new things from it. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, as we we continue on in the study and the, this wonderful book, that we would uh, again gain those things from it that you'd have us gain from it, and nothing else, Lord. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.